So this screencast covers the use of PKA and PKAH as predictive tools in organic chemistry, particularly as applied to the second year carbonyl chemistry module. So PKA is the minus logarithm of Ka, which is the acid dissociation constant. So for a general reaction of a molecule HX, breaking into its component ions H plus and X minus, Ka is the equilibrium constant for this process. And as a result, it's worked out the same as any other equilibrium constant, in that it's the concentration of the products, in this case the dissociated ions, over the concentration of the starting materials. So when we talk about the pKa value for a molecule, we're generally referring to the molecule on the left-hand side of its equilibrium before it's broken down into H plus and X minus. But pKa can tell us something both about the nature of Hx and about the nature of X minus. And the position of this equilibrium and the value of the pKa is a reflection of the stability of X minus. So the more stable X minus is, the more the equilibrium will be tilted to the right, and vice versa. So if we use a real example here, hydrogen chloride, we know that Cl- is a nice stable anion, so you would expect this equilibrium to be tilted towards the right-hand side. And this is reflected in the pK value of hydrogen chloride, which is minus 7, indicating that this equilibrium is indeed tilted over to the right-hand side. So this tells us something about HCl. It tells us that HCl is acidic, it's strongly acidic, because it's quite willing to give up H+, and obviously Cl- as a result. But it also tells us about Cl- on this side. It tells us that X- Cl- is more stable because the equilibrium is tilted in this direction. It also tells us about HCl that whatever X is here, in this case chloride, is a better leaving group. It's willing to leave the molecule with a pair of electrons to become Cl-. Um, because Cl- is more stable, it tells us that Cl- is less basic or less nucleophilic. So the more stable your anion is on this side, the less likely it is to want to go throwing that extra pair of electrons around, picking up protons or attacking things as a nucleophile. So since we're talking about both sides of the equilibrium here, it's useful to have terminology which indicates which side you're talking about. So if we're talking about the molecule on the left-hand side, we've got the pKa value. But we need something to be able to talk about X- minus as well. And for that, we have pKAH. So the pKAH value is the pKa of the conjugate acid. So the conjugate acid of Cl- minus is HCl. So the value is exactly the same. It just determines now that we're talking about X- minus as a focus rather than Hx. So let's see what effect it has if we change what X is in this uh, scenario. So we go from hydrogen chloride here to water. Well, in this case, the equilibrium is now tilted back towards the left-hand side, and this is reflected by the pKa value of water, which is 15.7. So this value of 15.7 tells us a few things. It tells us that Hx is now less acidic, certainly less acidic than HCl. Um, the pKaH of hydroxide now tells us that X- is less stable. So hydroxide is a less stable anion than chloride. It tells us that X is a worse leaving group. Hydroxide is certainly a worse leaving group than chloride. And the flip side of this X9- being less stable is that hydroxide is more basic and nucleophilic. So we know this experimentally. If we use sodium hydroxide compared to sodium chloride, that's a much stronger base. Uh, and we can take this to extremes. So if we change X again to CH3, in this case, the right side of the equilibrium is CH3 minus. So we know that this is a very, very unstable anion. Um, as a result, it's a very strong base or nucleophile. So methyl lithium, methyl magnesium bromide, that sort of thing. Very strong nucleophiles indeed. And this is reflected by the pKa value of methane at 56 and the pKH value of uh, methyl minus at 56 as well. So because this equilibrium is now so heavily weighted, it's worth bearing in mind that there's a logarithm in this uh, equation. So each of these units is a power of 10. So this is 56 orders of magnitude, effectively. Um, and you can think of this as an extremely heavily weighted equilibrium, or in fact, effectively irreversible. Um, so the odds of this of methane breaking into H plus and methyl minus are incredibly small. Um, so as a result, the equilibrium is effectively irreversible in this direction. So pKa and pKAH allow us to do a number of things in organic chemistry, mainly to do with predicting reactivity. And one of these things is predicting which groups are going to be good leaving groups or not. So this is a, a kind of abbreviated table which you'll find in your workbooks for this module. Um, 
But the underlying principle of this is that the pKa value is, is a reflection of how good a leaving group something is. And generally, species with low pKaH values tend to make good leaving groups, whereas species with high pKaH values tend to make very poor leaving groups. Uh, where we'll come across this most commonly in this module is in tetrahedral intermediates. So in this case, the oxygen lone pair wants to come down and kick out one of these three groups. But which of the three groups is it going to choose? Well, if we do all three in, in sequence and then look at the pKaH values of the groups that we've kicked out, we'll be able to predict which one's the most likely to leave. So if the lone pair comes down, starting with the one on the left, kicks out methyl minus, we end up with CH3 minus as our X minus, if you like. Uh, we know from before that the pKH of CH3- minus is 56. That means it's an incredibly poor leaving group, and it's unlikely that this process is going to happen. So instead, if the lone pair comes down and kicks out NH3+, we then end up with neutral ammonia as our leaving group. The pKH of ammonia is 10.5. That's a reasonably good leaving group. That's somewhere around here. So this process is actually viable. So it's worth noting at this stage that when we're talking about the acid dissociation constant, you know, H plus and X minus, X minus doesn't always have to be anionic. It can be a neutral molecule as well. So finally, if we kick out the group on the right, we end up with chloride, which again we know from before um, is an incredibly good leaving group, and its pKH reflects this. So the lower the number, the better the leaving group. So in this case, we would predict that this would be the pathway that would uh, carry on this reaction. So another area of organic chemistry that pKa and pKH can really help us out with is in our selection of acids and bases. So how strong an acid, how strong a base do you need to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve in your reaction? So a useful rule of thumb is that if the pKH of the base you're going to choose is higher than the pKa of the acid, the equilibrium will shift towards the products. So for instance, if we have pyridine and TFA, uh, going to pyridinium and trifluoroacetate, then if we look at the pKH value of pyridine, it's 5.2. The pKa value of TFA is minus 0.3. So this is five orders of magnitude higher than this. So we would expect the equilibrium to be weighted towards the products. And actually, this works the other way around as well, because the values for these two species are the same. It's just that we've swapped terminology. We're now looking at the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. So the pKa of pyridinium is 5.2. The pKh of trifluoroacetate is minus 0.3. This is not higher than this. So therefore, you'd expect the equilibrium not to be weighted towards the product, but to be weighted towards the starting materials in this case. So if we change our starting material now for a weaker acid, so regular acetic acid, the pKa value increases accordingly up to 4.8. So the pKh of our base is now only slightly higher than the pKa of our acid. So the equilibrium is actually reasonably even between um, products and starting materials, probably slightly weighted towards the products. And if we go to the other extreme, where we use an extremely weak base um, with a reasonably weak acid, then actually the equilibrium is weighted towards this side. Uh, and this kind of makes sense if you look at it backwards. So here we have sulfuric acid, which is a very strong acid. Here we have phenolate, which is reasonably basic. So you would expect this to protonate phenolate without any problems um, and form mainly this side of the equilibrium. So it's worth bearing in mind that the further apart these two numbers are, the heavier the equilibrium weighting. So these two numbers are very close together, so the equilibrium is reasonably even. This is a re highly reversible reaction. But if we push the two numbers really far apart, so n-butyl lithium is an extremely strong base with a pKH of about 50. Um, this is about 45 orders of magnitude higher than um, the pKa of uh, acetic acid. Then effectively this becomes irreversible in one direction. Um, and it's kind of logical if you think about it the other way around. Would you really expect acetate to be able to deprotonate butane? Probably not. So in these cases, this is how we get irreversible reactions. So if we're trying to irreversibly deprotonate something, we need to choose a base which has a pKH that's substantially higher than whatever it is we're trying to remove a proton from. So this is an abridged version of the table that you've got in your workbook. Um, and you can see it's organized by the, uh, the conjugate acids with their pKa values on the left hand side and the corresponding conjugate bases with their pKH values on the right hand side. So we can think about this, these two things separately. Here are the things that you want to deprotonate and here are the bases that you're going to use to deprotonate them. So um, because the pKa value decreases as we go up this list, this is a measure of acidity. So the, the stronger acids are up here and you can see hydrochloric, sulfuric and so on. Um, so you can think about pKa as being a measure of acidity. pKH 
you can think of as being a measure of basicity or nuclear felicity. So as we go down this list, we get the stronger bases, the stronger nuclear files down here. So essentially all we need to do is if we want to deprotonate something to a substantial degree, we just need to pick a base which has a higher pKH value than the pKa of whatever it is we're trying to deprotonate. So as an example, if we wanted to deprotonate a 1,3-dicarbonyl, which has a pKa value of 11, uh, the base that we choose will determine uh, the degree of deprotonation, how reversible the reaction is. So if we start out at the top, if we choose an, uh, an acetate, a carboxylate ion, which has got a pKH value of somewhere between 1.5 and 5, Obviously, this is less than the pKa value of the acid. So if we do this kind of reaction, you would expect the equilibrium to be heavily weighted towards the starting materials. So it's not to say that some of this enolate doesn't form, it's just it's going to be a minor equilibrium contributor. So you might expect the reaction to be reasonably slow. If we change our base up a little bit, we now choose ammonia. Um, ammonia's pKH value is 10.5. Um, this is roughly comparable to the pKa value of whatever it is you're trying to deprotonate. So actually the equilibrium is pretty even between these two, um, side reactions of ammonia attacking these carbonyls aside. So if we move up from ammonia to hydroxide, now the pKH of hydroxide is 15.7. This is now four orders of magnitude higher than the pKa of whatever it is we're trying to deprotonate. So actually the equilibrium weighs uh, more towards the right hand side, so you're forming a more substantial amount of this um, this enolate, but it's still a reversible reaction. If we take it to the extreme and we go to something like a, a, a lithium amide, uh, this is LDA for instance, we've now got 26 or 25 orders of magnitude between the pKH value of our base and the pKa value of our um, starting material. So we might expect this to be effectively irreversible in this direction. So if you've got a reaction where you need to form an enolate irreversibly, you need to pick a base which has got a substantially higher pKH value. So in this case, uh, LDA would be a good choice for irreversibly deprotonating this, um, this molecule.